Jane Cheney, Joe Sarah, Melinda Cook, Beth Moore, Patty Mayhew, that's Phyllis Mingo's sister, Mike Allen, Glenn Miller, Tracy Wood, Kenny Mims, Donna Winger, Kathy Beckworth, Barbara Floyd, Donna Serio, Johnny Little, Suzanne Strayler, people in Ukraine, Willie Ezel, Maisie Corder. All right, who else? Anybody else? He's almost out of the south, ain't he? Anybody else? Just Darlene, okay. Very good event. Would you lead us, please, sir? Sanctuary 588. If y'all please stand and join us, that's going to be our first song. <clears throat>
we sing at number 425. If y'all please stand and join me as we sing, this is going to be our offertory hymn. <laughs>
life into the Lord was alcoholism. I was an alcoholic, and one of the scriptures, you know, I, was, I, I still drank after I got saved and everything for a while. You know, I had a hard time breaking away from that. Uh, was this scripture about, you know, Jesus making uh, water into wine. And I had a hard time, you know, I was going, well, Jesus made wa water into wine. Obviously, he doesn't have any problem. In fact, I switched from drinking beer to wine just to try to match scripture a little bit. But uh, this song's called Wine into Water, and it's, it's, it's got a, it tells a little bit about some of the things I battled when I was dealing with it. Heard a multitude of prayers on my behalf. If I pray one more is not too much to ask. I've tried to fight this battle by myself. But it's a war that I can't win without your help. Nine, I'm as low any man can go I'm down and I can't fall much farther once upon a time you turn the water into wine and now on my knees I'm turning to your father could you help me turn the wine back into water So many times I've hurt the ones I love I push them to the edge of giving up They stood by me, but how much can they stand If I don't put this bottle in your hands Tonight I'm as low any man can go I'm down and I can't fall much farther Once upon a time you turned the water into wine And now on my knees I'm turning to your father Could you help me turn the wine back into water I shook my fist at heaven for all the hell that I've been through. Now I'm begging for forgiveness and a miracle from you. Tonight I'm as low as any man can go. I'm down and I can't fall much farther. Once upon a time, turn the water into wine. And now on my knees, I'm turning to your father. Could you help me turn the wine back into water? Could you help me turn this wine back into water? Yeah. back into the Lord's house, and we uh, dive back into our study through James. Uh, tonight we're going to be in James chapter 1, uh, verses 21 uh, through 25, a message entitled, Doers of the Word, Doers of the Word. I begin here reading in, uh, in verse 21, therefore... Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness 
and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Pray with me if you would. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these words that remind us that we must be doers of your word, that we must put our faith into action, that we must live out the difference, Father, that you've made in our lives. And as we come to know you through simple childlike faith, you don't keep us where we are, but you continue to transform us to be more like you. And Father, as a result of that, Lord, we, we want to do more to please you. We want to live in accordance to your will. We want to read and study more about you and about your word. And Father, to be able to come to you in prayer in those difficult times in life especially. But Father, we can always come to you and it's good to know that you hear and answer all of our prayers. Father, bless our time tonight. and Just give us the words and Lord, the wisdom that you would have us to receive. I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this section, uh, I cut off a few verses because there's so much going on. I didn't want to gather uh, those last couple of verses in this section because they're so rich in and of themselves. So in this section tonight, we're looking at, it includes the commandment for us to not only to hear God's word, but to obey it. Not only to, to hear and, and read God's word, but apply it to our everyday lives. It's not just enough, church, for us to hear God's word, but we must receive the word of God. And what that word receive here, what it literally means is to take hold of. It means for us not to just read it and say, oh, that's nice. And it says to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it says for us to love our husbands, love our wives as Christ loved the church. And oh, that's so good and that's so warm and refreshing. And, and we read it, but then we don't go out and live it in our everyday lives. God has given us many commandments in the scripture. And many of them involve love. And so as we're doers of the word, church, we must be loving and kind to other people, even those that are not like us. And so we take hold, we receive the whole word of God. And the way that we do that is by living it out in our everyday lives. It's what's been referred to as putting our faith into action. It's also been referred to as putting feet to our prayers. Putting our faith into action. In Psalm 119 verse 11. The psalmist says. Thy word I have hidden in my heart. That I might not sin against thee. Now what that means is. That I've soaked up God's word. Not only am I in the word. But watch this. The word's in me. So if someday. Some. Some. People, some person comes and knocks on your door. I'm here to confiscate all of your Bibles and all of God's Word. And they come in and they do that. And they say, if you're seen with a Bible, we're going to cut your head off. We're going to shoot you on the spot. And so you give up all of your Bibles. I've hidden it in my heart that I might not sin against God. So everywhere that we go, we're not able to take our Bibles. It's, it's not always... Uh, fitting it's not always convenient it's not everywhere that we go we can't we can't be prepared in the sense of carrying our bibles with us you say pastor you should have your bible everywhere that you go yes but not always it's not it's not it's not feasible but the way that we do is by having it in our hearts being doers of the word and not just hearers only First of all, this afternoon, number one, let's find in verse 21, let's look at the reception. Let's look at the reception. Now, for the sake, let's reread, therefore, 
lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive, there's that reception, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. We must receive the word of God. But in order for us to receive God's word, we must tune in. Now, I grew up in a generation and a time and era that I served multiple purposes in my home, but there were two particular purposes that I served. One, I served as the remote control. Turn the TV on, turn the TV off, turn the volume up, turn the volume down. Turn to one of the four channels that we were able to receive, unless the weather was bad and then we got a channel out of Memphis occasionally. But also, along with being the remote control, I was the antenna turner. And I would go out, and I would open the door, and my dad would sit in the house, and I would begin to turn the antenna. Keep going, keep going, slow down, stop, wait, wait, back up, there you go. Come back in and enjoy a television program. We would want to watch another program. I would go then outside again, turn the antenna. Anybody with me? Anybody remember those? And then, praise God for those days. And then we came, they came out with a, a, a device that turned it on its own. And I had graduated. And then we moved into a television that had a remote control. And I was no longer needed, so my parents kicked me out. No. <laughs> no. But we must tune in in order to receive God's word. We have to receive God's word with an open mind and an open heart. He says here for us to receive with meekness. Now, we, we, we live in a society that says, well, meekness is weakness. Not necessarily, though. The Bible says that blessed are the meek. So when we think about meekness, it, it, it reminds me of a word as humility. We must receive the word of God with humility. Otherwise, we might read the word of God and say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't like that part. I don't, I'm not going to worry about that part. I'm going to leave that part out. Love my neighbor as myself. Don't like it. Leave it out. But when I receive it with meekness, it says, I've got to do some things and ask God to help me in order for me to be able to love my neighbor. Meekness. There was a father who had, was just completely beside himself as looking at his son's failed test scores. And he said, son, if you fail your exams one more time, don't ever call me father again. Yes, father, the son replied meekly. After the exam, the son came home. How were the exams, son? Do you think you managed to pass this time? The son responded, no problem, dude. <laughs> now, probably not a good example of meekness, but meekness refers to having a gentle spirit. And so, in order for us to receive God's word, it must be done with a gentle spirit. So how do we receive with meekness the implanted word of God? It tells us right here in the pages of scripture by, by laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. It means to lay it aside. It, it looks like taking off a coat or, or an overgarment and taking it off, taking off a hat and laying it aside. In other words, I'm putting it away. I'm laying aside all filthiness, all overflow of wickedness. To kind of bring that down for us to understand, it really means that we just remove sin from our lives. So that's reception. Now if you've made number two and you've already written an R, I'm going to take you on a little, cur on a little tur turn tonight. We're going to look at not only the reception, but we're going to look at the deception. Okay? Might let, throw you a little curveball there. I know you've gotten used to my style, but we're going to look now at the deception. Because verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, what? Deceiving yourself. Now, how do we deceive ourselves? I think it tells us right there by not being doers of the word. We must, church, we must live out God's word. 
We must put it into action in our lives. Love your neighbor as yourself. We do that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We do that. Wives, be in submission to your husbands. We do that. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. We do that. We put God's word into action. Go ye therefore and make disciples. We do that. We don't just read it, feel warm and fuzzy about it, and lay it aside. No, we lay aside sin, filthiness, overflow of wickedness. But we pick up the word of God. If we only hear God's word and we don't live it out, church, we deceive ourselves. Look now at verses 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now, as this illustration here is being used, I, 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 use, I take this as an illustration. I, I don't think there's really any way that one could go to the mirror and look at themselves and walk away and forget what they look like. Now, I want to share something with you. Maybe you've never thought about. I've never seen my own face. Now, I've looked in the mirror and I've seen a reflection of me, but I've never seen my own face. Only by taking a picture, only by looking into the mirror, will I see that reflection of that image. Now, it's impossible for me to walk into the mirror, into the bathroom, or into the hallway and look into the mirror and say, who is that? No, we recognize ourselves. But here he's saying, he says, in other words, you really cannot be a hearer of the word only without being a doer of God's word. There was a wife who spoke to her husband. She was staring into the mirror and she said, you know, I'm old and I'm getting fat and I look like I haven't slept for a week. I need a compliment. And he said, well, your eyesight's perfect. <laughs> Watch out now. Hey, <laughs> not me. No, ma'am, no, sir. But see, it is impossible for us, church, to forget what we look like just so it should be impossible for us to be a hearer of God's word and not a doer as well should be impossible for us to hear God's word and not live it out. We must translate the Bible into action. Now that doesn't mean I've got to go dress up like Noah yesterday. You remember how much it rained yesterday? I've heard some people say over five inches of rain that we got. I had someone actually ask me last night uh, that I know where Noah still had the ark. Because it began to continue to rain and continue to... It's not telling us there by acting out, by, by translating the Bible into action. I don't have to go out and dress up like a character in the Bible. Brother Don, you don't have to go be Goliath. You, you could do a pretty good job at it because you've got the stature for sure. We don't have to go dress up like it. But rather it becomes to be who and what we are. Or rather we become to be who and what it is. For the world to see. We are maybe possibly the only Bible that someone ever sees until they come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what difference does it make? Preacher, that's your job. Sunday school teacher, that's your job. Missionary, that's your job. Friend, if you're a born-again believer, it's your job. I hope that's not his calling to go get his giant outfit because I'm, I'm going to find a place to hide. We deceive ourselves, though, when we only hear God's word and we don't heed it. There was a school teacher who lost her life savings in a business scheme that had been explained by a swindler. When her investment disappeared and her dream was shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth didn't you come to us first, the official asked. Don't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Oh, yes, said the teacher very sadly. I've always known about you, but I didn't come because I was afraid you would tell me not to do it. You know, see, the folly sometimes of human nature is that even when we know where the answers lie in God's word, 
we don't always turn there for fear of what it might say. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And if I don't go to the Bible and read that scripture, maybe I think in time, maybe it will go away. Maybe husbands, if we don't love our wives, we say, well, maybe if over time that verse will maybe go away. Children say, well, maybe if I don't obey my parents long enough, that verse will go away. But rather, we can deceive ourselves by not being ready to listen to God's word. Now, I believe that it is impossible for, excuse me, that it is possible for us to read the Bible without letting it speak to us. Even in the word of God it says that it's foreign to the lost man. How do we understand the Bible? Well, we go and we, we get learned. We get, we get schooled. We get, we get learned. We get, we get taught. We go get some knowledge. We go, to, we go get some certificates. And we go get some diplomas. And, and that's how we understand the Bible. I go get me a study Bible. And if that thing don't weigh 50 pounds, I don't want it. It's got to be this thick. It's got to have big pages and big letters and big words. And that's how I understand. No, we understand God's word through the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit. See, we can read it in an academic way without being affected by it. A lost person can read God's word, but they won't be able to understand it. Verse 21 refers to the implanted word of God, which means that it comes from God. God reveals, church, his word to us. Don't be deceived by thinking, well, I can just read enough of God's word. I can take it and I can permeate it in my life and I can soak it in and I can, I can wrap myself in it. And that will just be enough. I can read a cookbook, but that doesn't make me a chef. Just because we read the Bible doesn't mean that it becomes to be a part of who we are. See, God's Word is a sacred deposit in the Christian's life when he is born again. Impression without expression leads to depression. Let me share that with you one more time. Impression without expression leads to depression. If God's word is not impressed upon us into our lives and expressed out, it leads to depression. The perfect law of liberty, verse 25 refers to as, is that God's word is the perfect law that liberates us, that sets us free. It's the liberating word of God that says that we can have victory over sin, over death, over hell, over Satan because of what Jesus has done. The Bible, church, is good news. Now, if we read the Bible thorough enough and we read the hard stuff, we're going to understand that sometimes it corrects us. Sometimes God, is, as we say, we say God takes us to the woodshed. How many of you have been taken to the woodshed by God? Amen. Yeah, we have. And what we know by that is because whom the Lord loves, what? He chastens. So don't be deceived thinking that I can take the Bible and stick it in my shirt pocket and I'll have it close to my heart. Now that's not hiding the word of God in your heart. Now let's look third at the perception. Boy, I kind of took you on a, on a tailspin tonight, didn't I? Verse 25, Let, let's look at this. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Church, we must not only read God's word, but we must perceive God's word. We must understand it. We must know how to apply it to our lives. I've had people come up to me and say, man, I've read the Bible and I don't understand one word of it. Is Jesus your Savior? Well, I joined the church a long time ago. Is Jesus your Savior? Because 
The implanted Holy Spirit comes at the moment of salvation who then interprets the Bible to us. Now, it doesn't mean that we get saved in a moment that we do. We just open the Bible and we just, we just soak it all. No, as we grow in our faith and our walk with Christ, we grow more in His Word. I believe He reveals it more to us. But also, as it's been referred to as the inspired Word of God, it's not just another book that we go and we read. Every time that we read God's Word, we're going to see something else. He's going to reveal something more to us. It's the way that God speaks to us as His children. But the only way for us to be able to understand God's Word is through prayer and study. Because God will reveal, church, His Word to us. How do we know that? Because God wants to reveal His Word to us. God is not, His Word is not intended to be a mystery. God didn't write his love letter to us for it to be a, a, a puzzle to put the pieces together or, or some kind of a, a, a geocache where we've got to go this far and then we get a clue and, and we go and we find these coordinates and then we get another clue and then, and then we're... No, he wants to reveal his will to us. It's just so many times that we don't want to receive it and apply it to our lives. See, once we read and perceive God's word, there is no greater feeling. As Christians, we should desire to read God's word and understand it. I want to confess to you something about this morning's message. And I, I hope you could sense the compassion. But I was excited about being able to deliver that message that God had given me. And so it should be that same kind of genuine love that says, I don't got to read my Bible today. But what church? I get to read my Bible. I don't got to go to God in prayer. I get to go to God in prayer. So when we wake up in the mornings, the, the, it's not the first thing that we reach for is our phone, but the first thing that we reach for is our prayer language to our Heavenly Father saying, first of all, Lord, thank you for another day. You've allowed me to have a, leave out another day of life. And we recognize Him. We have a desire to read God's Word, and this comes from reading it with the intentions of understanding. We open up the Word of God, and we read it to be able to understand it and to be able to perceive it into our lives. On one dark rainy night, a salesman had a flat tire on a lonely road. But to his dismay, he had no lug wrench. Seeing a nearby farmhouse, he set out on foot. Surely the farmer will have a lug wrench, he thought. But would he even come to the door, he asked. And if he does, he'd probably be furious of me bothering him. He'd say, what's the big idea getting me out of bed in the middle of the night? This thought made the salesman angry. Why, that farmer is a selfish old cod to refuse to help me. Finally, the man reached the house frustrated and, and drenched, and he banged on the door. Who's there? A voice called out from inside the house. You know good and well who it is, yelled the salesman, his face red with anger. It's me, and you can keep your old lug wrench. I wouldn't borrow it if it was the last one in the country. See, that is a misunderstanding. Sometimes we and Satan will help us to have a misunderstanding, a misperception of God's word and God's will for our lives. It's imperative for us to have the desire to want to know and understand God's word. This evening I want to ask you this question. Do you have a desire to understand God's Word? So many times we have a daily Bible reading that we read, but it's really more of check that off the list. And so I read through my daily Bible reading. I don't, I don't perceive it. I don't soak it in. I don't allow it to permeate my life. I just read it and I go through it 
And I don't allow God to speak to me because it's just something that I've got to do. I wake up in the morning. I say, Lord, thank you for another day. Now, let me look at the weather. Let me see how much money is left in the bank. Let me, let me check and see uh, wh where the game ended last night as I fell asleep. I brush my teeth. I fix a cup of coffee, and I'm off on my day. On the way, I read my daily devotional that's sent to me through a smartphone app. I get that done and I move on throughout the rest of my day. I pray and ask God to bless my food just so that I won't choke on it. And then at the end of the day, Lord, thank you for this day. Amen. Is that understanding what God's will and plan is for our life? I don't think so. It's that we, we approach the day by saying, God, thank you for another day of life. Thank you for my family. Thank you not only for my house, but thank you for my home. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my church and for my church family. Thank you for all those many flaws that we live in the greatest nation in the world. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given me and on and on and on until it's so much so that I've ran out of time in, in, in my prayer life. You see what I'm going here with this? Then I get into God's Word and I begin to study. And I begin to dig. And I begin to spend more and more and more time reading and studying and understanding God's Word to be able to share it with someone else so that they too can come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we church must be doers of the Word, not just hearers only. We hear those stories of Jesus giving us commands to, to, to love our neighbor as ourself and for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And we hear that. We say that would be an ideal place situation if we were able to do that. But I don't have time to do that. We live such busy lives. Friend, it's imperative for us to take time for God and His Word. When I think about Jesus leaving the glory of heaven to come to this sin-cursed earth to die, He could have said, I am very busy interceding. I'm very busy being God the Son. You sinned, you messed up, you figure it out. Good luck. But because He loved us enough, so church it's imperative for us as we read God's word that we understand because of his sacrifice because he died for us that we must be willing to live for him being doers of the word not just hearers only but the only way that we're going to be able to be doers of the word is by understanding God's will and plan for our lives because the general will of God for all mankind is that they come to know Him for salvation. But then there's a specific will for each and every one of us. Not all of us can lead the music. Not all of us can play the instrument. Not all of us can run the sound. Not all of us can turn on the air conditioner and the heat and the lights. Not all of us can deliver the message. Not all of us can sing, but we've all been gifted with different talents and different abilities, and so we must use those not to say, look at me and what I can do, but look at my God and what He can do. Being doers of the Word means applying it to our lives. Not deceiving ourselves, saying, well, I'm a good enough person that I don't have to. Oh, I've got a good enough resume that I used to do. Look at what I used to be able to do. We never get too old or retire from serving God because one of the greatest ways that we can serve God, listen to me, is through prayer. Through prayer. Some of the greatest servants that I've ever met of God couldn't get up on the roof and patch the roof, couldn't come in and adjust the sound and get the lights set. They couldn't come in and help move tables and chairs. But they were prayer, listen to me, warriors. And that was a great way for them to be a doer of the word. So do you have that desire 
to understand God's word and God's will and his specific plan for you and your life. Asking him, God, how would you have me to serve you better? How can you have me to love my neighbor as myself? Asking, God, how would you, as, how would you have me as a husband to love my wife more? How would you have me as a child love my parents more? How would you, God, have me as a parent love and, and, and discern and discipline my children in the proper way? Lord, I want what you want for me in my life, and I want to understand your word. Church, we must have that desire. And I don't believe that we can come up with that on our own. We have to pray and ask God, Lord, help me. Give me that desire. Help me to fall in love with you, to read your love letter, and apply it to my life. Doers of the word and not hearers only. Join with me this evening as we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to take just a moment to think about what it means to be a doer of the word. That it's just more than just a, a, a daily Bible study. And it's more than just a rushing through the moment of prayer. But it's getting along with God. It's diving deep into His Word and seeking more. Satan would help you be deceived and say, well, you've already read that. Why would you need to read that again? You've already studied that. Why would you need to study that again? You're a member of the church and you're a good person. Isn't that enough, Satan would say? But because of the difference that Christ has made in our life, it's never enough. We want more. We want to know more and more and more about Jesus and his word and his will and his plan for our lives. Heavenly Father, my prayer tonight is very simple. Lord, that you would open up our minds and our hearts more to what your plan is for us. Help us to understand your word by laying aside all the filthiness and overflow of wickedness that Satan in this world has to offer. And not allowing us to be deceived, but letting us be ready to receive the implanted word of God. Thank you for this time tonight, God, that we've been able to gather freely and worship you. Bless this invitation. May it be a time of response as we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Don.